Do you want my name? <laughs> okay. What's your full name? My name is Andrew John Rumberger. R U M B E R G E R Gleason. And I'm the son of Helen Ramberger and Gus Gleason. You know what Gus is sh short for, right? What? You're supposed to ask him that. He never used sure. anything with Gus, so don't ask me. Okay. When and where were you born? Huh? When and where were you born? Like, I don't mean like what city, but like. I was born. Is that what you want? Yeah, like, so, yeah. First, ask when and where, and then you can say your your follow up question. When and where were you born? I was born in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. P H I L L I P S B U R G. At a hospital My parents at that time lived in Houtsdale How do you spell that? Pardon? How do you spell Houtsdale? H-O-U-T-Z H O U T Z B A L E. On November twenty third, nineteen hundred and five. What were your parents like when you were a kid? Pardon? What were your parents like when you were a kid? What were my parents like? What were your parents like? What were they like? Yeah. What were they like? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty tough to describe in a few words what your parents were like. Uh, my father was a man about five feet, ten inches. He attended St. Vincent's College. Is this what you want? Mm-hmm. How do you spell? I can't say that right. B-I-N-C-E-N-T-S. Where He was, uh, he was active in sports. Lettering, L-E-T-T-E-R-I-N-G. Or no, there's two R's in that, isn't it? Lettering. I'm not sure. In baseball and football. Grandfather, you know that I'm the world's worst speller. I'm the world's worst speller, so don't look to me for spelling. I was telling her on the way up, you know, on the story of what was your dad like. I thought that one of the stories, like the story about the train load full of bananas. About what? The train load full of bananas would be a better way of explaining what your dad was, was like. Originally... A salesman. And then a lawyer. Okay. 
Yeah, but if you want to tell her the story, I told her the story about the bananas. I think it's a good story. Okay. Keep to describe the kind of a person my father was. And this is a typical story. Right after they were married, and he was still a salesman, there was a whole carload of, of bananas. The and, train car. Huh? For these kids, carload wouldn't make any sense. You have to tell them it's a train car load train rather than a... Load of, yeah. They were... What's the word? Con Ro consigned? Yeah, consigned. They were consigned to a local merchant. You better let your father get this on. Yeah, I'm not going to forget yeah. it at all. They were consigned to a local merchant. But he didn't pick them up. So they had to sell them quick. Dad and a friend of his named Ed Kenny. bought the carload at a very low price. They had to unload the car right away. They didn't have any place to keep the bananas. There were no warehouses around Hodstale. So he just stored the bananas in our home, in the cellar. My mother always said that the smell of bananas never went away. They had to move before they could get away because they had to get away from the from the smell of the bananas. You can dress that up any way you want. To. Well, you can imagine how mom would feel if I came home and filled the basement with the crate after car. crate. All freight car. You've seen the train loads? It's huge. <laughs> What do you think about that? That is like amazing. I don't know how that would fit in our basement. Are there any stories that would capture what your mom was like in terms of that kind of, you know, things that your mom did that would, something that would be typical of your mom? about six or seven years old, I was playing on my front porch and jumping from the front porch down onto the ground. So I was told not to do it, but naturally I kept on doing it. So one time on one of the jumps, I slipped and I broke my arm. Now, the next day, we were supposed to go to Hopsdale. We were living in Dubois at that time for a vacation. The pain was very great that night, and I couldn't get to sleep. So Mother gave me a real heavy dose of what then was para, they called paragoric. It was a concoction that was sold over the counter, was supposed to be very safe, but in those days not having the Food and Drug Administration and so forth, the base of the drug was opium. <laughs> a little so, stronger than cocaine. A very serious drug. Oh my goodness. So I went right to sleep 
Then mother got worried that she gave me too much. And all that night, I didn't get any sleep anyway because she came out every hour or so and shook me to get me to wake to see that I was still living. <laughs> that was pretty good. You had a more questions, Kate, because it'll take them on to the, the, the uh, childhood toy and school questions. How many brothers and sisters did you have, and what were they like? Well, I had four brothers and three sisters. None of them were like each other. They were all individuals. And remember, because you have the same genes in you, <laughs> they were Irish and Pennsylvania Dutch. And what's that mean? That means you have a wild Irish streak in you <laughs> and a very stubborn Pennsylvania Dutch streak in you. You know, you know she gets it on both sides of her family because Diane's family is Gerstenmeyer German and Rogers Irish. So she gets, and they have more Irish in their blood from mom than they do from me, which is kind of funny. Well, I'm half Irish, yeah. half Pennsylvania Dutch, because dad's family were pure Irish and mother's family were pure Pennsylvania Dutch. Yeah, but, yeah, Irish. but granny diluted the, the Irish by putting in that Welsh blood. Oh yeah, I mean, that was terrible of her, but anyway. She, but then mom and dad diluted it further with Scott's blood you know, so she's almost one half Irish on her mom's side, straight down because the whole family's Irish. Oh, well, there's a chance for. Her. Yeah, there's all a chance. That, there's a with chance. With all that Welsh and Scotch in me, I don't know, but you got a chance with all that Irish. In you. I I want to go out of her question sequence because we're going to do a history sequence in a second, but I want to make sure we get it on tape because I know I never got it on tape before. What do you remember about what was going on in the United States when the Irish were fighting for their freedom and what was going on in the United States Irish community? Well, the, uh, the Irish over on Donegal Hill, of course, were very nationalistic. And uh, they raised money and uh, supported the Irish. What happened in 1916, though, when the when the Easter Rebellion was put down? I mean, what was that like? Did you guys even hear about it then? Oh, yeah. Well, they all, all the Irish figured that's just a temporary setback. Remember, they'd been fighting for, what, 500 years? They weren't going to give up. But they'd been licked so often and come back that they weren't going to sit down and take it. Did you guys celebrate when the when the independence was finally granted? Well, by that time we'd moved over here. Oh, so that was... So I don't know. Okay. You can go back to your questions, okay. Kate. Sorry. Were you close with any of your siblings? And huh? Were you really close with any of your siblings more than the others? I can't. Were you closer with one of your siblings than the others? Yes. And I was very close to my brother, Ted. What was he like as a kid? Ted was a twin. And I was close to Betty, but not nearly as close as I was to Ted. And that closeness existed throughout my whole life. What did Ted end up doing? Huh? What did Ted end up doing? Ted was a doctor. He was 
a very dedicated person. He served in the Army as a battalion surgeon with the 32nd Division. Do you want this? Mm hmm. Absolutely. In the Pacific. He was one of the most decorated doctors in Pennsylvania. He received the Silver Star and the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. What did those mean? For, huh? What did those thoughts They're Army decorations. Mm, awards. Award. Purple Heart is when you're injured, but the Bronze Star and the Silver Star are for, for doing something above and beyond the call of duty. That you with did something very special. With an utter disregard for your personal safety. That's Tur part of yeah. the citation. Didn't, wasn't one of your other brothers uh, pretty Tur well decorated in the Tur war? Turk got the uh, Silver or the Bronze Star and the uh, Purple Heart. I like the story of when he, the two stories from Uncle Turk that I like best are the one where he was not at his base when World War II struck out. Can you tell Kate about that? The day of Pearl Harbor, I received a phone call from Wichita Falls, Texas, and it was my brother Turk, who was had been drafted into the Army. The draft started a year before the war broke out. He had gone AWOL and was in Wichita Falls. Absent without leave. Which meant... He wasn't that, supposed to be there and he was. Pardon? <laughs> he wasn't supposed to be there, but he was. Like, she got it. He was, he wasn't, he was there and he wasn't supposed to be. That's right. And if he didn't get back to the base right away, he would probably be labeled a deserter. And a deserter in wartime isn't good. <laughs> so he, he and another guy that had gone AWOL had found a fellow with an airplane in Wichita Falls who for a hundred dollars would fly them back to San Antonio where he's stationed. So he wanted to know if I'd wire him the hundred dollars, which I certainly got down quick and wired it to him. And he got back before they had roll call the next morning. Because otherwise it'd have been in big trouble. He'd have been in big trouble. The other story that I love from, from Turk was what he said to the general who was giving him the medal when, when the general asked him what he liked best about the army. The, That's when he said he didn't like anything about the army. But if, not a gosh if darn wanted, thing. If he wanted to stand there, he could tell him what he didn't like about it. Anyway, you, you can go back to your questions, Kate. I don't want to leave too far afield. What was school like when you when you were a kid? You need to speak up, Kate. What was school like when you were a kid? And did you well, like I went to I went to a Catholic school, and at that time, all the teachers were nuns. And they maintained strict, very strict discipline. How'd they do that? Can you give an example of their usual discipline? Mostly it was you had to stay after school. That was it? Yeah, it didn't seem like, like for me. Because 
Huh? What would happen? She liked school, so staying after school wouldn't be a punishment. <laughs> it was to us. We didn't want to stay after school, but uh, then everybody was afraid of them. And most of the parents of the kids who were 90% Irish were afraid to talk back because their parents or grandparents have been raised in Ireland and you just didn't talk back to nuns. What were the classes like? The classes, they taught by rote. What's that mean? You repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. In other words, if you were learning the tables, you start at two times one is two, ti two times two is four, up to twelve. Yeah. Then you repeated it and you repeated it and you repeated it until it's stuck in your head. I still think up until high school everything should be taught by rote. Now remember this, the one teacher taught every subject. You went in the classroom, you stayed in that classroom. You didn't get out of it until school was out. Not even for lunch? Huh? Not even for like lunch? Yeah, for lunch you got out, but I mean... No switching you, classes like no they do in high school. Classes. You were in that room and the one nun taught everything. And I think the answer to it, Kate, er, You got it. Katie, I think the answer to it was this. There were eight kids, as I told you, in our family. We come over to Johnstown, which at that time was rated one of the highest school districts in Pennsylvania. You could go to any school practically in the country if you graduated in the first third of your class at Johnstown High. You could get in the University of Pennsylvania, University of Pittsburgh, any of them. But we came from Du Bois. I was in my last year in high school. The rest of them were all the way down to the first grade. And we got at least as good and sometimes better grades over at Johnstown than we got in Du Bois. So you figure it was a pretty good so, school system. So it was a good school. It was a real good system. What did you do as far as when you were 10 years old? Use 10 as a time period because that's how old Kate is now. Huh? When you were 10 years old, what games did you play? Like, what toys? Oh, well, the Knights of Columbus that's KFC, had a big gymnasium. So we played football in the fall. During the winter, they had a swimming pool and a gym. We played basketball. Then come about May, then we played baseball and went swimming. In different places outdoors. We just continued that all summer. Did you have chores you had to do? Unless you could sneak out. <laughs> 
What kind of what kind of chores did you have? About like ten. Not very many. Mother gave up after a while, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Like what kind of chores did you have? They, in fact, Dad used to get mad because she'd have somebody come to cut the grass and somebody, because she could never get any of us to do anything. <laughs> We'd skip. <laughs> At first opening and you'd run. You were a uh, kid in, at the time World War I broke out. What was that like? It, uh, when World War I broke out, I was only about nine years old. It's pretty hard to realize the seriousness of it at that time. We played war. I can never remember of enduring any hardships during the war. Did anybody from the town go off to fight? Oh, yes. Did anybody not come back? There were a lot. Do you remember any of them? Yeah, there was a Negan and there was a Cannon. One of the Sullivans. I can't remember. Andy, you're going back over 80 years. Oh, I know. I just, there's that. I can't remember names now. But there's that, that, uh, that good Irish song, that Private William McBride, you know, where he says, can I sit down by your graveside? And there's, you know, was there a sweetheart left behind or, or are you a picture in a brown leather frame that nobody remembers? And that was kind of the thought that I wanted to ask you about was, you know, when you think back, you know, those people who didn't come back, who never got to live the life that they were going to live, you know, as a nine-year-old, do you remember those people and, you know, that... Very vaguely, yeah. What about the end of the war? I remember you told me a story the last time I was here about the ringing of the bells at the end of the war and the... Well, that was over in Hounsville. Yeah. over there for some... Well, do you want to... Tell Kate that story now about that. You're not the, having me telling Kate this. You're getting this for yourself. It's a little bit of both. She's doing her homework assignment. They lost the yeah. tape. When the World War I was over, I was over in Houtsdale. It was during August, and I usually went to Houtsdale and stayed all summer during the vacation. So before the real armistice came, you won't be able to take this down. We've got the tape. Uh, there was a, what they called the false armistice. There was an announcement that the war was over. Actually, it wasn't over till about three days later. But when the news came to Houtsdale, it came at night. And all the bells, as soon as the news came, they started ringing all the bells all over town to celebrate. I was about, at that time, I was about nine, ten years old. So I got out of bed, and got dressed, and ran up to the church where they were ringing the bells. And a guy named Eddie Gorman and another guy named Sal were ringing the bells, and they said to me, Andy, how about you ringing these bells, and we're going up to the Polish church. Nobody's gotten their bells yet, and we're going to start to ring their bells. So I said, all right. I was ringing the bell, and the priest, who was in charge of the church, came in, and he said, how'd you get in here? And I said, well, I, a couple of fellows were ringing the bell and I came in and they asked me to ring it on. He said, no, you broke in. I said, no, that's the way it happened. I don't believe you. Who were the boys? Well, by that time I knew 
if I told who they were, they were going to get in trouble. So I wouldn't tell them. And he said, all right. He said, if you're not out of town in 48 hours, I'm going to have you arrested for breaking into the church. Well, I went back that night to my Aunt Alice's where I was staying. I couldn't sleep. I was scared. I thought I was going to get driven out of town. So the next day I went down to town to my grandfather who ran a hardware store there. And I told him what had happened. It's the only time in my life I have ever heard my grandfather swear. Only time I ever heard him swear. And he turned around and he went right up to where the priest lived. And he said, don't you worry about it. So I didn't worry about it. Did you leave town within 48 hours? I certainly did not. <laughs> I didn't think so. Now, there was one other story about your visits to Houtsdale that I think fit her, her question about the toys. You had a cousin that was ill, that you used to visit? Yeah. And he had a room full of toys. Do you want to tell that story? Because that really answers your question about the kind of toys that people had back then, too. Well, I had a cousin, Sean, and he had a incurable condition. He was about my age, and I used to go over to Hotstill and visit him. And I used to stay with them, and we were very, very close. His parents were well-to-do, and he had every toy that you can think of. That every time I bought him a toy, he made them buy a toy for me. And if there was any toy he didn't have at that time, I don't know what it was. So I had practically every toy you could think of. Can you describe some of the toys? Andy, please. Well, uh, did, you had told me before, like, the, there were the carousels and the wooden a, animals. And there was one of the, the toys that I remember most vividly was a circus that was made in Germany. All the animals, and there were, must have been 50 of them, tigers, elephants, lions, and everything, they had joints, and you could twist them around. Then they also had trapeze actors and clowns, and uh, the things that the clowns used, and they were all made that you could bend them, their joints and everything, and you could put them like climbing a ladder or put them on a trapeze, and they had little grooves that they would put their hands in. The magnificent things. All handmade. All handmade. They were only made in Germany. He got a set of them, and then insisted his parents get me a set, too. Back then, they didn't have plastic. Have what? They didn't have plastic. Oh, no, they were wood. Yeah. They were wood. You can go back to your list of questions, Kate. Where are we? Oh, yes. Now, that's all of interview for you. You ask <laughs> me what you want. <laughs> okay. That's well, fair. What was it like during the Great Depression? Honest, Katie, if you didn't live the Great Depression, I don't think anybody can describe it. I was lucky. My father had a good position, and I had jobs. But people were really desperate to get work. And we were building highways at that time. 
We only work somebody for two days for 10 hours and they got four dollars a day and they were living on eight dollars a week and raising families on eight dollars a week. People were desperate. People may, may not like Franklin Roosevelt, but in my opinion, if Franklin Roosevelt hadn't been elected president and started DPA and other government agencies, we'd have had anarchy in this country. Conditions were so bad. What's anarchy mean? Huh? What does anarchy mean? Anarchy means revolution. People fighting in the streets because they didn't have food or jobs. Oh, not good. Unless you actually lived through the Depression. I don't think any, I have never read an account of the Depression that to me seemed adequate.